general terms, a retaining wall is a structure used for supporting soil laterally so that it can be retained at different levels on two sides. A gravity retaining wall uses only the self weight of the wall mass to resist lateral earth pressure. Lateral earth pressure increases with depth behind the wall. To resist this pressure, the wall mass must be sufficient to overcome these forces. Therefore, the higher the wall, the greater the resisting mass must be. When designing a gravity wall, we look at three possible ways it can fail. We consider it a wall to fail when it has moved in some way from its original position. The first is called base sliding. In this case, the earth pressure is greater than the friction force generally generated along the base. So the wall slides forward. We can improve our base sliding resistance by increasing the weight of the wall and by having a rough surface along the base, which creates a higher frictional force. The second possible way the wall can move is by overturning or tipping over. In this case, the earth pressure causes the wall to start tipping over or rotating about the toe, as shown here. This is based on the concept of leverage, when a force is being applied over a distance, or in this case, the height of the wall. We can improve our overturning resistance by increasing the width or front to back depth of the wall. Finally, if the soil beneath the wall is not capable of supporting it, the wall can sink, which is known as a foundation failure, as shown here. An example of another type of gravity wall would be a natural stone wall, where the mass of the wall is constructed from dry stacked or mortared natural stone. This is really the first version of the segmental retaining wall. Typically, this type of wall is very expensive as it uses natural stone and requires skilled craftsmen to properly install it. There's also no proper way to engineer this type of wall as the properties of natural stone pieces are not known or extremely variable. Another early example of a gravity wall is the wood crib. In this case, the gravity mass is composed of a wood structure, then filled with gravel or some other soil. As we have seen over the years, the wood has a tendency to rot, despite being treated with toxic chemicals. This is due to the constant moisture contained in the infill soils. It may be initially seen as economical, but they typically don't last that long. Another type of retaining wall is called a cantilever wall, which uses a large base slab to act as a cantilevered mass against sliding and overturning. The cantilever wall has traditionally been the most common type of structural wall, used for decades on commercial projects, highways, bridge abutments, and so on. This type of wall is constructed using reinforced concrete and is relatively expensive due to the specialized forms used to construct it, as well as reinforcing steel and specialized labor. This type of wall can also be susceptible to corrosion over time and eventually cracking, which is why many that are decades old need replacing. In situations where there is no room to excavate back and construct either a cantilever or other types of mass gravity walls. A wall can be constructed by driving piles or large steel beams into the ground and connecting them with lagging. In this situation, instead of creating a mass to resist lateral earth pressure, the piles are driven, driven deep into the ground, utilizing the undisturbed foundation soils to support them. The piles then act as a cantilever type of beam, supporting the earth pressure by transferring it to the ground below. This type of wall is very expensive as it requires specialized pile driving equipment, massive steel beams, and either wood, steel, or concrete lagging. Typically, this type of structure is used only when there is absolutely no room for excavation, such as to build foundations for a large building in a high density area. Which brings us to segmental retaining walls. 
The definition of an SRW is a type of retaining wall constructed out of dry stacked precast concrete units that are usually connected through shear keys or mechanical connectors. A key term there is dry stacked um, because these walls are not mortared. It gives them a lot of advantages with, with respect to their ability to move and um, conform with the settlement and soil and so on. In the early 1970s, Reesey Stone Systems developed the first segmental retaining wall called Pisa Stone, which was basically a prefabricated version of a dry stack wall, but with the advantage of being dimensionally accurate, so it was easy to stack, and with an interlocking tongue and groove to provide automatic alignment and structural stability. Compared to a natural stack stone wall, this saved time. It could be engineered as the shear or interlock properties were well known and was more economical. As a bonus, it could be made in various colors or textures. This is one of the first pieces of stone walls ever constructed. It is over 50 years old and is a testament to the durability of these products. All Reesey stone walls are manufactured on the same equipment that high strength paving stones are made with, resulting in great, greater durability and long term performance. This particular wall is uh, in Aurora, Ontario, and it's actually very close to the roadways, you can see. And uh, for 50 years, it's been basically splashed with salt spray um, from, the, uh, from the roadway. So it's held up very well. Since that time, many different types of segmental retaining walls have been introduced to the market, ranging from lightweight, economical hollow blocks to large, massive wet cast units. As segmental retaining walls were a largely a new technology, as compared to the traditional types of walls previously discussed, there was a need for manufacturers to standardize the design and specifications of SRWs. The National Concrete Masonry Association, or NCMA, is a trade organization that was originally formed to support the concrete masonry or building block industry as many of the masonry block producers also started manufacturing srws the ncma evolved to incorporate them into their scope the ncma now acts as the primary industry body for srw research best practices and design methodologies and is a great resource for information similar to the previous examples a segmental retaining wall is basically a type of gravity wall that creates a mass through the self-weight of the SRW units themselves, like the simple wall being shown here, or combines with other elements such as reinforcements or tiebacks to create greater depth when mass is needed. In its simplest form, the SRW units are stacked as shown on a gravel base with a drainage layer behind them. This is called a single depth gravity SRW because all the units are the same front to back depth. As with the previous gravity walls we have shown, the mass of the SRW units creates a friction force along the base which resists the lateral earth pressure from the adjacent soil. Since we are relying only on the weight of the SRW units, the critical dimension here is the depth of the units shown as D, which gives the wall its mass. We can relate the depth of the wall D to the height of the wall H. This is because as the wall gets higher, we require the depth of the block or wall mass to be greater. Since we have learned that earth pressure increases with height. As a general rule of thumb, the depth of the wall typically must be at least 30 to 50% of the wall height H. It should be noted that these ratios can scale up or down for almost any wall height. For example, if a 50% depth to height ratio is required for a particular site, then a 6 foot high wall would need a 3 foot deep SRW unit. For the same conditions, a 20 foot high wall would then require a 10 foot deep SRW unit. This ratio will vary based on a few factors. As the earth pressures increase, the depth of the wall must also increase. These factors include 
slopes of, above the wall. The steeper the slope, the more pressure is exerted on the wall. The quality of soil being retained, a high quality gravel will exert less force than, let's say, a clay. And the presence of other surcharges, such as a traffic load or a footing for a house, something like that. As mentioned, we can use the SRW units in different ways to create different types of gravity structures. The first example shown was a single depth gravity SRW. As we have learned, to go higher with our gravity wall, we must increase the depth of the unit because earth, earth pressure increases with height. However, this works the other way as well. Earth pressure decreases as you are closer to the top of the wall. Knowing this, we can create a type of gravity wall where we decrease the depth of the block as we get closer to the top because the pressure in this area is less. This creates a more economical gravity wall as we are only putting mass where we need it. This type of gravity wall is called a multi-depth SRW. The multi-depth wall utilizes different depth SRW units and incorporates the drainage backfill as part of the weight of the wall to create a composite mass that is essentially the depth of the bottom block of the wall. Another type of gravity wall that we can construct is a crib wall, where a combination of tieback units and dead men dead men units join the front facing to form a crib. The crib is then filled with drainage aggregate for weight, once again creating a composite mass. This type of wall is typically the most expensive SRW you can build. However, they can be ideal for situations where very high walls are required and space is limited to build them. Even at between $55 and $75 a square foot for a durable crib wall, they are still a lot more economical than reinforced concrete or so soldier pile walls. Finally, the geogrid reinforced SRW is the most innovative and economical way method of constructing higher walls. So what is geogrid reinforcement? Geogrid reinforcement is a mesh-like material used to reinforce soil. The most common type is made of a polyester fiber coated in a polyethylene although there are different types that are out there, such as HDPE. Geogrid, or grid, is very strong in tension and acts just like reinforcing steel and concrete, providing the tensile resistance needed to keep the soil mass together. We discuss geogrid in more detail later, but for now, know that it's an amazing material with decades of proven performance, and it plays a very, very important role in SRWs. A grid reinforced SRW is basically a large gravity wall composed of SRW facing units, backfill soil, and geogrid reinforcements. These elements combine to create a composite mass. Even thousands of years ago, builders knew that gravel and soil could be made stronger and stay together by including layers of some type of strong mat, such as woven branches or reeds. Roman roads were actually constructed this way, as well as sections of the Great Wall of China. The depth of the wall and grid reinforced wall is created by the length of the reinforcement. Typically, the length of reinforcement is between 60% 70% of the wall height. If we take a minute to think back to our true gravity walls, we remember that the depth ratio for a gravity wall was between 30% and 50% of the wall height. While in comparison, geogrid reinforced walls require a depth ratio between 60% and 70% of the wall height. We will explain why this is the case later, but for now, just understand that although grid reinforced walls are generally more economical, when we are short on space, we sometimes need, need to use a gravity wall just to be able to fit it into the site. To design a geogrid reinforced wall, we have to look at all potential ways it can fail. 
First, we assess the external stability of the composite mass. This is checking to make sure the overall wall depth, which makes up the wall mass, is sufficient to resist lateral earth pressure behind it. These three modes of failure are the same as the ones outlined earlier with the gravity walls, which is overall base sliding, overturning, and bearing capacity failure or foundation failure. Next, we make sure that this composite structure remains whole or intact as one big mass. When looking at internal stability, we ensure that the geogrid reinforcements are not overstressed or that they don't pull out of the reinforced soil mass or they don't slide out within the reinforced mass. Finally, we check to make sure the SRW facing units remain connected to the reinforcements and the front of our structure remains intact. We check our block to, to, block to geogrid connection, the potential for bulging in the face of the wall, and finally the top of the wall is stable. We will touch on these modes of failure a bit later, but this gives you a general idea of how we assess these structures. So far we've reviewed various types of walls that exist and provided an overview of segmental retaining walls in all their forms. We've established that SRWs provide the benefit of being a more economical solution than other walls and can be engineered with confidence. Now we'll take a look at some of the other benefits of SRWs. One of the major advantages of SRWs is the fact that they are flexible in nature because they are not mortared together and can allow movement and settlement without failing. As a result, in most cases, we do not have to found them below the frost line, which is typically around four feet deep, like we do with rigid structures such as reinforced concrete walls. The normal embedment for SRWs is around 10% of the wall height. This saves, saves significant time and money in excavation. <clears throat> Unlike reinforced concrete or soldier, soldier pile, pile walls, SRWs allow water to percolate through the face, which helps prevent hydro hydrostatic pressure from building up behind the wall. With a rigid reinforced concrete wall, water is contained behind the wall unless weep holes have been provided. With an SRW, because the face is dry stacked without mortar, water can move through the face and percolate out of the wall system. Having said this, we always want to ensure a well-designed and well-constructed drainage system behind the SRW, so we don't have to rely on this. SRWs typically are installed much faster than other types of walls. For machine-placed SRWs, installation rates from 300 square feet to 1,000 square feet per day are possible, which works very well for tight timelines or schedules. Due to the segmented nature of SRWs, the size and weight allows for design flexibility to create complex architectural layouts or difficult to access locations. SRWs can also be designed to have far superior appearance than other types of walls with varying colors and textures. Finally, due to the flexible nature of SRWs, Research and field performance has proven that under seismic or earthquake loading conditions, SRW technology is far superior to other options. Rigid structures such as reinforced con concrete attempt to resist earthquake loads, while SRWs allow greater movement and therefore dissipate the loads better. In conclusion, the invention of the SRW allowed landscape designers a superior alternative to other wall options, with better economics being only the beginning. For the past 50 years, SRWs have come a long way in proving they are a viable and superior alternative to most other wall systems. <clears throat>